Hi, it's Michael, the host of Impact Hustlers. And before we dive into today's episode, I'd like to ask you for a favor. If you get any value out of the episode today, please consider sharing it with a friend who would benefit from it. Or leave us a review on your favorite podcasting app. We're an independent podcast and are investing a lot of time and effort in publishing inspiring new episodes every week. We can only do this because of people who support us. And now there is an easy way to do so. You can give us a small tip or a regular donation to make sure we can keep going. Every penny is invested into making the podcast even bigger and better. And you can do so on buymeacoffee.com slash impact hustlers buymeacoffee.com slash impact hustlers thanks very much for your support thanks for listening and let's get into the show in today's episode i speak to anish varmer the founder and ceo of air air is reinventing the way credit scoring works by creating a fairer and more transparent standard this enables people that previously lacked the credit history to access credit by sharing information that credit reference agencies usually wouldn't have Era has raised uh, about $23 million in funding from investors such as White Star Capital, Experian Ventures, and Crane VC. So far, the company has scored about $10 billion worth of credit, and it's great to have you on the show, Anish. Thanks for having me here. <laughs> Thanks for joining. So there is a personal story behind Air. Um, you started about six and a half years, seven years ago, something like that. And I think a while back before that, you actually experienced the problem you're now solving with AIR yourself. Talk us through that. Yeah, so I often joke that behind most startups, you have a, a frustrated founder who's trying to solve his or her own problem out there. Um, it's true for AIR a bit. Uh, I mean, I definitely did not come from the world of consumer credit. Um, I got introduced to this problem through my own personal episode. Uh, which now is probably 13, 14 years ago when I first moved to the UK. Um, and that helped me get an appreciation of the problem. But the more I talk to people out there, and you know, over many years, this used to be my little personal fight in the corner with the system. I was like, mm. somebody has to go fix the system, and I'm going to write angry letters to the government and <laughs> the regulators and banks and politicians. And I mean, I wrote to a lot of people, and this was like a four or five year journey of just highlighting the problem and a lot of people gave me time and said that's an important problem i agree yes yes you're right there is a problem here but nobody wanted to solve the problem hmm. and that was quite frustrating for me because ultimately you know hearing that you're on the right track is useful but i'm making a noise making noise about this because i want this to be solved hmm. and eventually it dawned upon me that the only way to get beyond this is to get on the inside build a company from the inside out and try solving the problem and, and in doing so maybe fixing the ecosystem properly. What's the core of the problem? What is the core of the problem lack of information or even the incumbents not really willing to innovate or like what, what's the core of it then? I mean the way I describe it often is it's like the software layer that's running on the ecosystem hmm. if you sort of visualize it that way. It's just like the software is out of date, right? And the software has some data pieces to it. It has some decisions. It has some logic. And the whole ecosystem just needed like a software upgrade. It's almost like, you know, the old iPhone made sense when your expectations were different, when you had different data sets and you had different, you know, use cases. But now if you kind of go back to iOS 1, you'd be pretty frustrated. And that's only 10 years ago. In our space, we're going back 50 years and things kind of have been static. And if you think about you know, the lifestyles we live, the world we live in, the data that's available, consumer expectations, you know, the prevalence of instant decision making, the prevalence of consumers wanting an answer now, uh, the desire to have much more personalized outcomes, you know, that's not the same system that existed in the 50s. In the 1950s was a very different world. Mm -hmm. So somewhere along the way, people forgot to press an upgrade button and I just feel heirs saying, okay, look, it's time to press an upgrade button. We're mm -hmm. going to go back and do all the hard work from the scratch to rebuild that operating system across the ecosystem. And for us, that's really at the heart of our mission because we, if we do that properly, 
consumers and lenders or banks both get a better outcome. And that's a pretty powerful win-win on both sides, right? Um, so that, I often describe it, and that's, I think, a way for people to visualize it, that it's like a really old piece of device that just happens to be running old software. Mm. If you give it an upgrade, sometimes the whole thing changes. Mm. So there you go. Amazing. Um, so if we dive a bit deeper on that, um, I've experienced the issue myself, actually, moving <laughs> from Germany to the UK. And whatever my credit score was in Germany, nobody was interested in that in the UK. Um, so had, having to build that from scratch and uh, it takes ages until you even get to a point where you can access any uh, credit. I think that's one issue. Um, so And it seems like you're really focused on the audience that is worthy of credit, is not a super high risk, but um, is currently kind of not covered by the current system or not covered properly, right? So banks and lenders should actually be lending to them, but they don't because they don't have the sufficient information, right? So what AIR does, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but is you integrate into uh, vendors, um, basically into the customer experience, where then if somebody would get rejected otherwise, you actually pick it up and say, hey, look, if you give us a bit more information, we can probably even get your loan. Is that correct? Is that how it works from yeah, the customer point I think of view? The, the, at the heart of it, it talks about this idea that nobody knows more about you than you, right? So the idea that you are the best source of knowledge and data about yourself, and also from a legality perspective, you're the best person to unlock it. Hmm. Uh, so we call this first party data. This is the most powerful, the most relevant financial data you can ever get. So we love going to the source, which is the consumer, and say, hey, you're in this situation. Help us understand a bit more about your financial life, your outgoings, your incomings, your choices you're making, uh, financial products you're using, how you're thinking about your profession, your career, all the things that would influence your financial outcomes, your credit outcomes. Um, and that helps us create a much more holistic sort of profile of you as a consumer obviously with your consent mm -hmm. and you know we are also mindful about the things we want to be seeing in there right, to make it fair for everybody um, and we've seen that this is actually really relevant across the lending life cycle so the use case you talked about which is helping people who are new to credit or maybe from a new country massive use case in fact that's the use case i got introduced to the problem mm -hmm. by we're also seeing people who are let's say self-employed or freelancers or contractors I mean, their struggles also are solution answers. But even if you go much more downstream, you know, people who have existing lines of credit, one of the things we're finding is as we do this sort of holistic view on them, we're able to detect if they're starting to get into a problem of uh, financial distress or vulnerability, areas which are surprisingly not talked a lot about out there. Mm -hmm. But by us being able to detect it, it A, helps the consumer, but B, also helps the lender think about, hey, I might need to get some proactive action here because it's in my interest as a lender and the consumer's interest to try to avert the situation so nobody has a default event or sort of going off the cliff, as it's mm. called. And that's bad. Nobody likes that outcome. Nobody wants to be in an outcome where debt recovery has started and all that. So we're really finding this as an interesting play across the whole credit life cycle. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, we're doing this in the UK, and now we've started doing this in the US as well, so hmm. you know, taking it to new frontiers. Amazing. Um, so uh, the value proposition for the lenders, I assume, is that they will be able to borrow with a similar risk uh, to new types of customers they couldn't access before. Is that pretty much what yeah. you're trying to do? I mean, them? the way I describe it, and, and this is like a, a statement we use, which is, you know, enable credit stop the debt burden, right? So the two <laughs> phrases look like they're contradicting each other, but we want the ability for consumers to be able to access credit as a useful tool when needed, but ideally not pushing them over the line into that debt burden, which <laughs> is the unfortunate side of credit if not managed properly. It's, it's a bit like fire, right? It's so useful to mold metal and you know build things, but you can also get your fingers burnt, <laughs> and that's not the outcome you want from it. So. It's important for a company like ours to find that balance in the way we think about our research, the way we think about our product. Uh, for example, we never let our product to be used by sort of the high cost payday lenders, for example. You know, the guys are charging you know, thousands of persons of interest. It's, it's kind of ridiculous, in fact, that they exist. But we think that's not only irresponsible for a company like ours to work with, it's also not the right kind of credit product for consumers. 
mm-hmm. period. And it's going to push them over the edge. So that kind of responsibility ultimately should come down to companies. And I think every company needs to step up and make a choice about what it prioritizes, profit or people. Mm-hmm. And I think this is an answer for us to say that we think what we're serving with people, we got to serve them right. How do you make sure to build a culture like that? I think I feel when I sit across you, you're really driven by that mission as well. It's not You're not just doing just another company. You founded companies before, but you are really driven by the mission behind it. How, how do you build a culture in air for people that are joining the team to really be driven by that mission? Yeah, I mean, you're right. Um, I have the fortunate uh, history of having done a few of the startups. Not all of them went the right way, but... You know, when I decided that I'm going to get back in the game and build another company, and you know, this was a pretty big undertaking usually, I really knew that if I'm going to get back in the game, I wanted to build something that stood for a purpose. And it wasn't just, here's another company that's exploiting a monetary arbitrage or exploiting an opportunity to make some profit and you know, move on. Um, And maybe that was just my own maturity of having, you know, moved up from my 20s when I was building simpler companies to much more complex companies now. Uh, and one of the few things I did, and, you know, maybe this is useful for other founders to know out there, is I believe that you have to start early with this. Uh, you know, you cannot try to retrofit uh, a culture or your set of values on a company when it gets past a certain size. So you've got to start really early. And in our case, of, I think we were... In fact, day one onwards, we kind of knew the kind of company we wanted to be, the values we're going to have, the, the things we're going to say no to, uh, the things we're going to say yes to. Uh, and some of it was written. Um, and then as we grew, and I think not far, like when we were employee eight or nine, we started writing this out in a little bit more of a systematic way, codifying it, as they call it. Um, in fact, um, I have written a book for the company. Uh, mm-hmm. which uh, we don't actually let outsiders see, but maybe afterwards I'll show you. Um, it's called The Book of Bonsai. Uh, it's only issued to AIR employees when they start. Mm-hmm. But a lot of it talks about you know, the AIR way of doing things. Why do we choose certain paths as a company? Uh, why do we prioritize certain outcomes? Why do we care about certain uh, directions that we want to follow? And it stems from this idea that You know, as a company grows, majority of the decision making moves away from the founder or the early people like me, and it gets distributed down through the company. Hmm. And every day, employees are making a thousand micro decisions about anything, right? Right from the type of code that's being written or the language on the website, the design of the office, the design of marketing materials you know, how we communicate a certain message to our own employees, how do we take action against certain choices in the market. And you want to empower those employees to make decisions which are in line with the company's thinking. Hmm. And the idea of this book, we call it the Book of Bonsai, was to help people understand how to make those decisions as air. Hmm. So they are A, autonomous in the way they're moving ahead, but also aligned towards the same outcome. Uh, and it's hard. I mean, we spend a lot of time talking about this. Um, sometimes people get bored, but I start every board meeting talking about this. And sometimes the board is like, come on, guys, we've got to move to the next topic. But that alignment has to go right from the top, the board, the investors, all the way down to every single employee. Even when we're hiring employees, you know, our book of bonsai, which talks about our four values, is something we look at in the interview process to see whether this potential candidate who could be very sharp on paper is going to align with our values and is going to be able to respect them and grow with them. Um, so it is a very end-to-end process. It's um, Therefore, it's also something that the founders or some of the early members of the team really have to think about as guardians because uh, you know values are ultimately things which you're willing to fight for and which you're willing to give other things up for. Hmm. Right. Otherwise, they're not really values. Otherwise, mm. they're just statements on paper. If you're not willing to make sacrifices against them, they're no good. I think this is such crucial advice, right? It's very easy to put up a bunch of nice words on the walls and say collaboration, innovation, things like that, right? And and it just doesn't mean much because you're not really making a trade-off. It's it's almost like strategy where you, you have to make a trade-off. And with culture, you're like saying no to a lot of things. And I think this is such an important point to make, yeah. 
Thanks for yeah, sharing. That's true. <laughs> um, great. Uh, let's let's move a bit. Uh, you already gave some advice for founders, um, but let's think a bit about the last six, seven years in your journey of founding Air to now. You have a team of about thirty people, I think, here in, in the office and uh, have loads of big customers as well. So, um, what were some of the hardest? Uh, lessons you had to learn throughout those years and what would you advise founders uh, that are starting out now to avoid those type of lessons or learn from them yeah so obviously uh, they say that every founder is always learning from every startup and so you're progressively getting better so hopefully being my third I'm making new mistakes and not the same mistakes again uh, but I would tell, I think there's two areas which I, I am quite um, keen to help others understand. So one, obviously, we just talked about, you know, the values of the culture of the company and you know, why you stand for what you stand for. And the other, I think, is um, I believe it's important for people to be able to understand the long-term outcome. Uh, now, why I talk about the long-term is because sometimes some startups are built for a short-term run. And some are built for the long term. And if you are not clear about where you want to play, and this goes back to a little bit more from culture into strategy, you don't align on strategy as a company. And you might not know why you're making certain decisions, right? Because if you're short-term focused, and again, nothing wrong with that. There's many startups that have been built for a quick flip, as they call it. Nothing wrong with that. It's, it's what they wanted. But if you're playing the long-term game, then you make slightly different decisions. You invest in things like, in our case, regulation is a pretty big part of our work in fintech. We were one of the earliest companies to go to the regulator and say, hey, we want to be regulated. And they looked at us and said, look, every tech startup we've ever met is running away from us. You guys are coming towards us. Hmm. Clearly, you're playing a different game here. Uh, but I think also then extends to how you perceive the kind of partnerships you make in the market, uh, how you think about the, the lenders you work with or the ecosystem that you work with. Um, I mean, I would say one of the mistakes that we kind of made early on, and maybe in retrospect I should, I should have tried to change how we went about this, was the idea that we were maybe a bit too cautious in the early days because we were entering a space which did not have any innovation in there, right? So uh, I remember the regulators used to joke with us that there's three very large companies in our ecosystem, and they're so large that, you know, us entering as a fourth, it doesn't even make sense. Like there's a, it's almost like the size of the sun versus a small asteroid, mm. right? Uh, <laughs> that's an analogy. And I think it at times scared us because we were worried that, oh my God, there's such a big ecosystem and the idea of change or innovation would be not well received. So we kind of went into our shell a bit. Um, and it was okay. We invested back in research. We invested in sort of being very methodical. But one of the things, and maybe in retrospect, I should have done more is help the ecosystem understand air early on. Hmm. And I think that helps you bring people on who understand your purpose and your existence, and they become supporters and advocates. So, you know, maybe we've been a bit guilty of being um, under the radar, especially for a company that is trying to make change at a big scale. Hmm. You need to build that community around you. And I've seen uh, other startups who are maybe up against equally big charge, uh, challenges, uh, do that in a, in a nicer way. And even if this community isn't immediately creating, a, let's say, a profit or revenue, what they are doing is cheering you on or supporting your mission or ensuring that the ecosystem is bought into why you exist. Uh, so something that we've uh, maybe learned the hard way and I think we're trying to change and you know, mm -hmm. we've been doing a lot more uh, public and outward facing stuff. And I think it's been good to see people responding positively to that. Is that also about educating the end users? And um, because obviously your model relies a lot through uh, actually getting to lenders and integrating with them, and then Air is not even the main brand that people interact with. They may see it in the process, but um, are you changing the strategy a bit to focus more even on the uh, end users of your? Product? Yeah. So you know, we actually our brand does come through. So every mm. lender that sends uh, any consumer through us, um, the air brand is always visible. Mm. It's something we've been very proud of. We never white label. But you're right, to some extent, it does mean that we need to spend more time engaging with consumers, uh, understanding their concerns, understanding how they feel about the ecosystem. And, mm. you know, obviously, it happened in the early days, but sometimes you kind of get lost in the process of 
regulation and security and data. And I think for us, it's really important. And you know, we've been we've acknowledged it and go back to it. Is getting right in front of the consumer at all possible times on a daily basis, understanding and engaging with them. And it's something, you know, my product teams really brought to the front of their mind as well. And I, I really appreciate that. I think it's it's the it's the right thing to do. Uh, the other thing is also, and this is a hard one for some people to think about, is how do you think about the journey of your team through this, you know, um, uh, process? Um, this is a, a long slog. We've been at it for, like you said, six years. Um, obviously, you know, we're building a long-term startup, so a long-term company. So you got to think about, you know, how is the team scaling up with this? Are they getting coached? Are they getting trained? Um, there's a great phrase out there, which is, you know, what got you here isn't going to get you there, mm. right? So you have to think as well, like, you know, four or five years into the game, you know, some of the things you did, which got you to this point, you need to kind of reset and reboot. And then again, in four to five years, you need to reset and reboot for the scaling and the growth. Uh, and it's sometimes emotional for people to get attached to the old ways of doing things. Mm. Uh, but any founder listening to this, you know, m be mindful of that. Sometimes you have to take some hard decisions, but you need to understand that you might need to upgrade things or move on. Hmm. Um, and that can happen across the board. So, you know, it's, it's important to acknowledge that. Hmm. You talked about building a long-term company. Um, and uh, I'd love your advice uh, for founders that are looking at that. I think a lot of the founders I speak to, they're driven by social impact, but also not uh, necessarily kind of a narrow social enterprise, but really like building a long-term company that will last and have a long-term impact on a lot of people uh, and be economically and socially sustainable in the long run, so, right? So um, after six years, a lot of VCs uh, may be knocking on doors and be like, look, we need an exit. Like we need to, you know, get a return to our LPs. Um, Can you say? Can you share anything on that? How do you align with your investors and with all your stakeholders to be like, look, we're here to build something for the long term, not for three years down the line to then do a quick exit? Yeah, it's a good point, right? And I think um, as founders, one of the responsibilities you have is fundraising. But I also think alongside the responsibility of just raising funds is to help the investors who are looking at you understand the kind of company you're going to be. And not just the financials and the numbers and the product and all the buzzwords, but the way you're making choices. So I talked about the book of bonsai, for example. So, you know, we do spend time informing potential investors who talk to us about, guys, this is the kind of company we're building. These are the kind of choices we're taking. And, you know, we are looking at this from a long-term perspective. Our aim is to be a single, independent, large company that's, you know, not necessarily having to be acquired, but I think can stand on its own two feet. Uh, it's a bold vision. Um, it scares some investors, I'll be honest, and I think that's fine. I think it separates, you know, the kind of people we want to be talking to. And some people get attracted to that idea because they're like, wow, this is interesting. We don't really hear about that in London where people are trying to build the market leader for what it's trying to do, right? Mm. There's sadly been a, a wave of companies that got to a certain stage and they then kind of sold out to the, the closest international buyer. So it'd be nice for UK to start, you know, building global leaders mm. in the sector. We definitely think with Air, we're pretty original. What we're doing is really well respected in the UK and the US, other parts of the world. So we have a good opportunity. Uh, but going further, and I think this is where, again, maybe advice for founders is, you should really try to understand how your investors work. What mm. is their business model? How do they get paid? How do they get compensated? Because you need to also respect their business model, but align to it. So yes, you'll have some traditional VCs who have a 10-year fund. You know, one of the things I ask a lot of them about is, you know, what is your fund structure? Are you allowed to do extensions? Because if you look in the Valley, there have been funds which extend out to 15, 16 years, and that gives them more runway. Mm. Um, whereas in Europe, traditionally, it's not been that. So again, it's a good conversation to have. The other thing is look at other sources of slightly more patient capital. So mm. it could be corporate venture companies who have a slightly different landscape on why they're investing. And further yet, there are other funds which tend to invest from an evergreen perspective because they are driven by the mission and they understand it's a 20, 25 year cycle at times. I mean, they're even more patient than I am. <laughs> <laughs> so you do have to match your investor profile with the kind of company you're trying to build. But a lot of that starts by being upfront at the very start. Hmm. It will scare some investors away. I know uh, and I've been there. But 
the net benefit is those who are left with you really understand why they're getting in bed with you and why they want to get mm. in and get this thing done. Um, so that alignment helps. Um, like I said, again, we're, we're still successful on paper, not on, in reality. So yeah. we have a long way to go. Story to be written. Um, I want to talk about a topic, collaboration versus competition. I think we quickly tapped onto it just before we started recording. Um, and you actually got an investor called Experian Ventures, which is um, the venture arm of Experian, which is one of the big uh, incumbents. So uh, I think there may be already a hint in terms of collaboration versus competition. But uh, how, how do you think about that um, in terms of air competing or collaborating with incumbents, but also other companies. Uh, we had um, the, the founder of um, Credit Kudos uh, uh, on here a while ago. There's other companies that are doing similar things. Uh, how, how do you see you as air and you as a person collaborating or competing with, with uh, others in the space? Yeah, so, you know, people have often described air as a category of one company. So we are a bit unusual in that category since we, what we do, there's not a lot of companies out there that want to do because it's the hard way of doing things. But what that does allow us to do is being our own independent category, we can partner engage with a lot more companies, right? Because we're not necessarily in their category competing with them. Um, so if you take the traditional bureaus, you know, we've always had a very cordial relationship with them in many cases and in just about all cases rather, when we work with a lender or a bank, it doesn't displace the existing bureau, right? We, we're very public to say, look, that is a useful source of data. It's not bad. It's just you need to layer on, going back to the analogy, layer on another layer on top of that, which is the air layer, so to speak. And so that's your next level of operating system. And that gives you a much more holistic picture. So it became obvious to us, and we were doing a number of technical integrations with lenders where you know, Experian and even some of the other bureaus are involved. So for us, it's been very natural to say, okay, look, we're already integrated from a technical and product perspective. All we're doing now is by taking the next step, uh, we're formalizing some of this. And actually, they've been a very good partner, right? Because from a distribution perspective, they have a wide reach, so we benefit from that. Um, we, we also benefit from possibly areas of joint research and collaboration because you know, I know what we're standing for. And I think this goes back to my original idea, right? If you know the kind of company you're trying to build, if you know the long-term journey, then all these become useful partners who are supporting that journey. If you don't know where you're trying to get to, you're unsure about how do you engage and how do you partner with these companies. Um, so for us, we were very clear about where we want to get to. And so when you know, any of these companies approach us, we have a, a clear view of where to partner, you know, where to collaborate, where there's maybe opportunities to be strategic. Um, and possibly in the future, maybe Air would invest in other companies as well, right? Because you know, we see yeah. our own ecosystem building up. Amazing. Uh, we're coming towards the end of the episode and there's always one question I ask, uh, which is very much in line with your long-term philosophy. Um, and I'd love to hear from you if you think about the next 10 years of AIR. Uh, how does the world look like in 10 years if AIR succeeds? That's a good question because I think I would break it into two parts. So, you know, markets where we have been present for a while, like, you know, the UK and now the US, Naturally, you would have a much deeper level of penetration and engagement. And, you know, we would ideally be in a stage where it is very common and accepted for air to be adopted across the ecosystem. And, you know, I'm sure you have things, read things like the technology adoption curve, right, where it's early adopters and the laggards and the market leaders. Uh, and we're going through that cycle. It's been amazing to see, like, that theory holds up for air as well in the U.K. and the U.S., but equally important for us is this idea that what we're doing isn't a UK-US problem. It's a global problem. You know, I've, I've been fortunate in my life to live around the world, in Asia, in South America, this and that. And we do see opportunities for what we're doing to go out to places like South America and Asia. And naturally, you know, those markets we're going to be entering in a few years. So we would be a little bit behind the curve in terms of, you know, the UK is more mature. The you know, places like Brazil, which I think are really interesting we would have just started. And so maybe in 10 years from now, we would still be in the midst of an adoption cycle. Uh, but we are very much focused on this idea of taking this global, right? This is, it's very much built into our DNA as a company. We don't think that we're doing this as a UK only play. We, we see this as a global play. Um, and that forces you to rethink the idea of what you are as a company, right? This is the concept of being born global. 
So some companies kind of think, oh, we're, we're a one country company and then we're going to go internationalize. Mm -hmm. With AIR, I always said, look, we're born global, right? Day one, we have to behave like we're an international company, which mm -hmm. might only be operating in the UK, but that's only an interim. So uh, it's a mindset. And I think it's mm -hmm. really important to have that mindset day one. Amazing. That's a great mindset to have, especially in the fintech financial space where you depend on local regulators. Uh, but it's great to hear that you're already uh, looking to expand to the US. So that's what you're in the middle of, I guess, right now. Yes, yeah. you're right. There's a lot of conversations at the regulatory level with the ecosystem, um, some participants which happen to be on both sides, which is great. But um, yeah, as a, as a tech founder, I never thought I would spend so much time in Washington, D.C., but <laughs> I have. Uh, we're actually, in our U.S. setup is in Washington, D.C., where oh. we have our uh, small employee base for the U.S., so uh, yeah. Thank you very much for joining me today. It was great to hear your story and uh, your wisdom as well. Uh, thanks very much for sharing that, and it was great to have you on the show. Hope it helps. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe share the episode, leave us a review and consider becoming a supporter on buymeacoffee.com slash impacthustlers. This means a lot to me. Thank you very much for tuning in and see you next time. Bye.